So welcome in for the first panel of today's symposium. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Professor Jeffrey Jackson. I am the director for Washburn Center for Excellence and Advocacy, and I'm very excited that I get to stand up here and be the moderator for the, the first panel today, which is going to be talking about trial and jury practice in the post-truth era. Um, so first off, I'd like to introduce uh, the real stars of this show, and those are our three distinguished panelists that we have. Uh, immediately to my left is Professor Kara Cunningham Warren, and she's an associate professor of law at the University of Detroit Mercy, where she's also served as the assistant dean of academic initiatives and assistant dean of international programs. And she has recently earned her master's of law from the University of Toronto. Um, and she teaches in international law and comparative legal theory and analysis. And she's the chair elect of the American Association of Law Schools section on North American Cooperation and the former co-chair of the Legal Writing Institute's Global Legal Skills Writing Community. Her scholarship focuses on sovereignty and cooperation questions in international and domestic law. And uh, she's had articles that analyze the sanctuary city debate, the Flint water crisis, which was a piece that she workshopped here at Washburn, and changes in legal education. She's currently working on a cooperation piece that will be included involving the, the crime of aggression with the International Criminal Court that will be included in a new volume published by the Nuremberg Academy to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the, Nurem of the court. And she's the author of a textbook to be published soon, International Law in Context. Then our second speaker of the day is going to be John Campbell. John's a trial and appellate lawyer turned professor. He's a trial, he trained as a trial lawyer under John Simon, a member of the Inner Circle of Advocates, and was a consumer attorney. Uh, his, the verdicts and settlements that he's been involved in exceed $350 million, and he's handled appeals in the 8th, 2nd, 10th, and the United States Supreme Court. He's now an associate professor of the practice of law at the University of Denver, Sturm College of Law, and he teaches torts, evidence, legal writing, and live client appellate practices. His scholarship focuses on empirical studies of jury behavior and writing style and how that impacts the outcomes that you see. He's the co-founder of the Denver Empirical Justice Institute, which is dedicated to improving trial strategy and policies that impact trial. And he's also the founder of, the, of a company, Empirical Jury, that helps plaintiff trial lawyers apply experimental principles and big data to focus on their case, pick a better jury, and improve their clients' results. And batting cleanup for us today is Colin McRoberts of the law firm of Vasher McRoberts. He's a former staff clerk to the Seventh Circuit, bench clerk for the Honorable Nancy Atlas in the Southern District of Texas. He was with the Chicago office of Steptoe and Johnson for about seven years, handling cases dealing with fraudulent securitization of exotic life settlement securities. Um, he's now, as I said, with the boutique law firm of Vasher McRoberts, and they specialize in commercial negotiation. Uh, their current and former clients include Bloomberg, General Motors, Sotheby's, the U United Auto Workers, the U.S. Army and Navy Special Forces, the Make-A-Wish Foundation, and various diplomats. And he practices now in one of the areas of interest is irrationality which is no, but in particular, how to talk with and productively engage people who are in the grips of irrational thinking. Um, he works with clients on how to negotiate with irrational people, how to identify irrational behavior, and he is the author of, of a book soon to be published on how to confront conspiracy theories and other extreme irrational beliefs. The thing that I found most interesting there is that as research for that book, he spent a week on a cruise ship with hundreds of conspiracy theorists for the Conspiracy Cruise, <laughs> which is an ocean-going conference for people who discuss theories like how to avoid paying income tax by having your birth certificate notarized. Apparently, uh, two of the speakers of that cruise have since been convicted for tax fraud. <laughs> Who 
could have seen that coming? <laughs> and other frauds. So the way that this panel is going to run is I'm, they're each going to have a presentation for 15 minutes and or thereabouts. And after that, I'll be roaming through the audience and you can ask questions of the panel for the rest of the time. So could you please welcome our first speaker to the podium, which is Kara Cunningham Warren. Professor Warren. Good morning, everyone. As I was thinking about the title of my remarks today, I, was, I wanted to insert the word cooperation, but I wasn't sure how we would feel Wednesday morning about one, whether we wanted to cooperate, or two, if we wanted to cooperate, whether we thought it was possible. So I thought it was safer to stick with this title, um, Law in a Post-Truth Era. But my hope today, my goal today, is to help us to think about this space that we're in right now, and what we can do to move ourselves forward, whether that's personally for our own well-being, whether it's as professors, what we can do to help students, or as students, what you can do in assuming your own role in moving us forward in this post-truth era, because that's where we are, right? <coughs> where we are today. And my hope is that everyone will feel empowered. There's some sliver, there's some control that we have over the space that we're in, and a way to move ourselves forward. As Jeff mentioned, uh, my scholarship focuses on cooperation and balance of power questions. And as I was working through topics like the Flint water crisis or the sanctuary city debate, I realized that there was a phenomenon that was occurring. And what I'm seeing is, is we have this phenomenon of otherization. Otherization in the sense that either people on the other side of the debate, they're just different from us. So maybe we decide not to even debate the question or they're alien to us, they're foreign to us, and in some ways they're even an enemy to us. But when otherization occurs, you hit this brick wall. Either you disengage from the conversation, and you know, air quotes in terms of conversation, or you're ready to do battle. This is pitched battle, us versus them. So when I was looking at these topics of federalism, balance of power, sovereignty questions, I kept seeing this otherization that was occurring. And then the second part that I'm seeing of this phenomenon is that for those who are still willing to debate, air quotes on the word debate, we're debating the wrong issue. So I'm starting to think about this as an otherization phenomenon, this idea that when we otherize the other side, we either then make it impossible to talk, talk, or when we do, we're talking about the wrong issue. We've lost sight of what's really going on. And so what I'd like us to talk about today, really not the air quotes this time, but to have a genuine conversation, is what is this otherization effect? How is it manifesting itself? And what are the ramifications for our ability to solve problems and to cooperate? And then I have some proposed solutions. So as I mentioned, the first piece that I did on American federalism focused on the Flint water crisis. And if you want to talk about post-truth, this picture here shows the water from Detroit, that's the water that the residents of Flint were receiving before we flipped to the Flint River. And so the water at the top is the water that the residents for 14 months were told that it was safe to drink. So post-truth evidence exhibit 101. But in terms of this phenomenon of authorization, you see this where we treat the people of Flint as if they're different. But this is a problem, we sympathize with them, but that's not a problem that we face. But what I saw in my research is that it really is a cooperative federalism problem. That we're relying on this federalism model, it's an inverted pyramid, where we're putting the most pressure on the least capable actor, the local water supplier. So in today's environment, literally the environment in which we live, but then also budgetary issues, et cetera, that suppliers can't deliver safe water. But we're not having that conversation because we think Flint is an aberration. The city of Newark, New Jersey, just started to distribute water filters to its population after months of saying that the water was safe. So my point is that otherization is occurring here, and it's lulling us into this sense of the lack of need to cooperate. Then I shifted to the sanctuary city debate. And here, this isn't like Flint where we're just otherizing in the sense that they're different from us. 
But what we're seeing in the sanctuary to city debate is that the people on both sides of this debate are locked in battle. It's that the people who are on the other side are evil. They are wrong doers. They are wrongful thinking. And so the otherization phenomenon is occurring, and so you can't have a debate with somebody who's your enemy. You're ready to do pitched battle. What that otherization, the phenomenon, the ramification of that is that we're not talking about the real issue. And I looked at the sanctuary city debate. Again, I was looking at liberal states' rights and the liberal states making arguments that usually are made by conservatives. And I was curious about that. But once I got into what was actually the debate, do you really know that the debate is about policing local communities? And there are a group of people on one side who say, if we have a large immigrant population, we would like to police them by making life so unattractive for them that they will self-deport, and therefore we don't have to police them. On the other side of the debate, you have people saying, if we have a large immigrant, non, uh, non undocumented immigrant population within our community, we choose to integrate them so they report crimes, so they'll serve as witnesses, so we can prosecute criminals, they'll seek treatment for communicable diseases. This is not a political question if you focus just on the debate, because Mayor Rudolph, Rudolph Giuliani from New York, when he was mayor of New York, advocated for New York's sanctuary policy. Or even today, the mayors and the chiefs of police of Dallas and Houston, deep in the state of Texas, Texas, which is one of the most restrictivist states in the union, they're treating it like a policing question. And we are not having that debate at all. So what I see in the sanctuary city debate is, again, the otherization of the other side, which creates a barrier to conversation, and that even those who are willing to debate were talking about the wrong thing. So what I'd like to do today is to talk about the Harputhi and Kinney article about jurors, and to talk about this phenomenon, how these jurors were otherized, and how it masks the real conversation that we should be having. So uh, in this case, for those of you who read the article or not, Harpoothian and Kinney are fighting the good fight in South Carolina. They're representing, they're doing a lot of the things that we go to law school to do. You want to become a lawyer, you want to protect people and do good. And that's what Harpoothian and Kinney are doing down in South Carolina, uh, representing a young African-American man wrongly accused of murder. But they start to weave in this other case that they had, an architectural firm suing the city of uh, city in South Carolina over breach of contract, the potential damages were $1.6 million. So of the two mock panels of juries that they impaneled to try, you know, to practice trying the case, four out of the 20 went rogue. They said, yeah, we think there's a breach of contract, but instead of $1.6 million, we would award, and they appear to pull a number out of their hat, $400,000, $600,000. So four out of the 20 went rogue. So just as a practical matter, hearing those facts, how many of you think, are you disturbed by what those four jurors did? They heard the evidence, they agreed there was a breach, the contract would be a mathematical formula in terms of what the damages were, and yet four just pulled some other number out of their hat. How many of you think that that's inappropriate or something we should talk about? Are you concerned that you would try a case and then people would make up a number? Right. So that's concerning. So Harputhian and Kenny are bringing up a topic that merits our conversation, that merits our attention in a post-truth era. But what they do is they go on to otherize these four. They say, without any evidence, that these four were Trump voters. They say they're unhappy with their wages. They're unhappy with society. And so they're just rejecting the truth. And I say, that's otherization. What does that have to do with what they actually did in this mock panel? And then what Harputhi and Akin go on to do is they target the two at the top. And we go into great detail about the two of the four. So remember, there are four. And the bottom two, the accountant and the stay-at-home mom, they fall away other than to say they were there, and those are the labels that they attract, that they attribute to those two. But you talk at the top two, and they get really special attention. Harpoothian and Kinney go on to describe not only their physical appearance, 
We know that the first one had an unkempt beard and was wearing overhauls. We know that he was rocking back and forth in his chair. We know that he came up with a $600,000 figure because that's what he thought was fair, and he stuck to it. The second farmer, farmer number two, we know that he had a goatee. We know it's really important for us to know that he had leathery, cracked skin and a goatee and a camouflage hat. So Harputhi and Akini go out of their way to further otherize these two when describing why they didn't reach the, um, the amount that they should have. So in terms of this phenomenon, you see these mock jurors being otherized as Trump voters and then getting special attention into their specific behavior. And the other two just fall away to the point where I forgot that they were even part of the narrative until I reread the article for the second time. So is there another explanation? And this goes to the second form of what I'm seeing or calling this otherization phenomenon. So once you otherize those jurors and say, they uh, came to the wrong result because they're just Trump voters. They couldn't figure out how to address a professional contract, which is what the authors suggest. What you do then is you obscure what could be a real issue, an issue that really merits our attention. So another uh, way of explaining what those jurors did, it could be a form of jury nullification. So jury nullification is in the criminal context when a panel will refuse to convict someone even if the evidence suggests that they should be convicted. But I'm saying maybe this is an analog in the civil law context. Paul Butler of Georgetown describes different reasons why juries nullify. One is a form of self-help. He says, if you are in a society where you have no voice, and all of a sudden you're called on to be a juror, you found a voice, and maybe you'll nullify. Or it could be when you lack, when you think the system lacks integrity. If you do not have respect for the jury system, then you might be more likely to go with your own gut. Paul um, Butler also talks about a third, and it was a form of community help. So he's talking about African-American juries in Washington, D.C., refusing to convict young African-American men of drug crimes. And the federal prosecutors, of which Paul um, Butler was one, is shaking his head like, we're trying to help you clean up your neighborhood here. Why won't you convict these young men? And it was for some jurors, they're saying, because they have a low-lying criminal offense here, you send them to prison, and then they come back to our society, and you're not helping our community one bit. So you're starting to hear when those three reasons why jury nullification exists, that explains what maybe what these jurors were doing. Is it that the guy who said, I think $600,000 is fair, right? This sense of um, his voice in the community, nobody usually hears him, but this is his one time when he can step up and say what's fair. Or for the second juror who folded his arms and said, nope, I'm sticking with my number. Uh, maybe it's that he didn't have respect for the institution or for the system. Or for both of them, talking about this idea of community self-help, what we know about the farmers in Richland County, the county where this case, this mock case occurred, was is that they have traumatic, for 10 years, decreases in commodity prices. So these farmers are feeling it. They also, in the same year that this mock panel was in, in panel, um, severe drought. If we were to fast forward into 2015, 16, and 18, they suffered severe flooding, billions of dollars of catastrophic flooding, thousand year flood in 2015. So for them, maybe they're saying, I agree that this architectural firm is owed money, but if the city has to pay them 1.6, that impacts our community, and we're relying heavily on the community today. So this is just one example when you read the Kinney article, they've otherized those voters and they've obscured this conversation about jury nullification. Or, thinking about it in electoral terms, they've lost the opportunity to talk about these farmers with respect to trade, climate change, severe weather events, government assistance, etc. So a truly lost opportunity. Another reason why these jurors might have gone rogue is the lack of an analytical framework. And this is what's so fascinating and what Dr. Strong touched on in her remarks this morning. Uh, Carl Llewellyn and Jerome Frank, more than 70 years ago, said that they were concerned about judges. <coughs> Carl Llewellyn noted, I'm concerned that judges reject something that's technically
completely within the range of a result, but that result wasn't psychologically available to the judge. Jerome Frank talked about judges when they hear conflicting testimony, that they're using subconscious bias to reach a decision. More recently, Ruth Sullivan, a noted expert on statutory interpretation, says that we have this internal process the way we interpret words. And what seems indisputable, indisputable to us is a distortion to someone else. And both seem obvious. So Carl Llewellyn, Frank, Sullivan, they're talking about problems that judges have when they're analyzing words. Or what trained legal minds, the problems that we have when we're analyzing words. So imagine what happens in the jury room. Mostly untrained people who have been either triggered through the trial process, maybe they've been otherized in the deliberation process, but untrained minds working through complex legal questions without the benefit. Think how we guide juries at the beginning. They can only hear certain information. They're instructed on what to do, and then we let them loose in the jury room in this untrained atmosphere. So the second thing that we could be talking about with respect to the Harpoothian article is how do we help jurors in a post-truth era navigate facts to analyze legal questions and legal problems. But that's not what's occurring. So even when I'm in the classroom teaching students, I don't ask students, what do you think? I say, what do you observe? What are the similarities? What are the differences? What inferences do you draw from those similarities or differences? And then you say, what do you think? Because if you ask at the upfront what people think, you're asking for their gut reaction, not for their thoughtful response. And so you can see that there's a reason why these jurors might have picked 400 or 600,000 out of the hat, because the deliberative process just asked them, well, what do you think the damages should be? So in terms of solutions, so I, I said that one is to identify where we are today. We are otherizing people, which creates hurdles to cooperation and to discourse. So what do we do to move off of this space? Because regardless of what side you're on, I don't think many of us like where we are today. One suggestion I have is to recognize the trigger. I did not see the Harputhi and Kinney article as a trigger until I started to look at it in this otherization context. I did not know that Harputhian and Kinney went on to try that case, and they got $1.65 million. It was a four-day trial. The jurors deliberated for two hours and came back with a unanimous verdict. So what we could be talking about is, what did they observe in the mock panels? What did they change for the real trial? But they have triggered us, whether it was purposeful or whether they are triggered and just couldn't help writing about it, but they have triggered us. If we recognize that pattern, I think that's step one for getting off of the space where we are today. Recognize that inadvertently, we are triggering one another, we are otherizing each other. And then that creates barriers to cooperation. The second thing I think we can think about doing is to know that we're empowered. Once you see that pattern, you see it for what it is. And even though I was thinking about it in terms of Flint Water and Sanctuary City, I was surprised when I saw it in the Kinney article as well. I said, wow, that's really, it's subconscious. It's there, and we're triggered. And once we're triggered, we can't even realize that we're triggered and we're moving off point. So recognizing the pattern is empowering. But also know that even though our politics or our juries might be embattled in this post-truth era, corporations are figuring it out. David Rock is the CEO of a Neural Leadership Institute, and he's working with companies because companies after 2016 came to him and said, I've got people on the line wearing Make America Great Again, right next to a guy wearing a Black Lives Matter hat. How do I get these two to work and keep the company moving forward? So in the corporate sphere, particularly with David Rock's scholarship, talks about ways that we can work together and move off this trigger. And I think that that scholarship is instructive. And then finally, it's this idea of what could we do to talk about juries? How could we help jurors in this post-truth era? Maybe it would be a solution section if Harpoothian and Kinney kept writing and stopped triggering us. Is it that jurors should be instructed, what are the steps to uh, legal analysis? The idea that you don't ask them up front, what do you think, but you say, what did you observe? 
or the same way that jurors get written jury instructions, do they get jury written instructions, written instructions that also list what evidence was introduced by both sides so that the jurors are forced to work through those facts and then explain why they might um, disregard them. So there are specific solutions we can do in the jury context. I think my final thought about what we can do, and you'll notice that all three of these bubbles, they're the talking points. It's the idea that I think we need to remember that as Americans, we're not others, we're Americans. We're proactive, we're creative, we're ingenious, we're problem solvers. And so we see a problem, let's stop engaging in the problem, let's stop otherizing each other, and then let's start talking on areas where we have common ground and go from there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Warren. Professor Campbell, you're up. Hey, thanks. Hi, everyone. I thought I'd start, so my background is as a trial lawyer, but when I, when I joined the academy and started uh, working as a law professor full-time, um, I, I sort of fell in love with the idea that you can do experimental work um, and studies to figure out why people do what they do and why jurors behave the way they do. It had a nice connection to my ongoing work as a trial lawyer, um, work I do now in jury consulting. Um, so forgive me, but I like, to, I like experiments and studies. So let me just ask first, how many of you have ever served on a jury? Let's see. High enough I can sort of tell. One, two, three, four. Uh, not many, six. And the problem is most of us have some legal connection, either lawyers or soon-to-be lawyers, uh, law professors. So it means you probably never will uh, because you get excluded pretty quickly. I'm going to read you two quotes. I'll be curious afterward to know uh, in a minute which one you think is right. Um, one more question. How many of you have seen the movie? It's a 90s movie, Runaway Jury, with John Cusack. Have you seen that? If you haven't, you should. It's a good, it's an entertaining movie. It's also a movie about the jury process. Um, there's a quote in it. Um, but let me give you this one first. This is Thomas Jefferson. So Thomas Jefferson said, I consider trial by jury as the only anchor yet imagined by man by which a government can be held to the principles of its constitution. It's a very high ideal, right? And it would not be stretching it to say that some of the people that wrote the Constitution, some of the founding fathers, um, viewed the jury as a check on tyranny. Uh, it was a way, and it, you might be interested to know, that originally jurors were not given just the right to find facts. Um, there's some really early, clear stuff that says jurors decide what's fair, they decide the law and the facts. And if they think the law is wrong, they can do what they want, because they're basically a panel of people who vote on what's right. Uh, and the idea was that's always going to be better than letting one judge do it. Um, you know, that's interesting because in the last 50 years, probably even less, we've seen a, an attack on juries. We've seen a lot of talk about the idea that juries uh, give away crazy verdicts, uh, and you can't, they can't be trusted. And implicit in that is that instead we should trust one person to do it, a judge, um, instead of a panel of citizens. So here's the other quote. This is from Runaway Jury. And if you haven't seen the movie, there's a guy who's sort of like supposed to be the jury consultant, jury whisperer, and he's going to swing the jury his way, and they've got all, it's like, the, it was like bull 20 years ago, right? So they're, they're doing this analytics, and they're going to figure out, and they're going to get the right people on, and maybe they're going to intimidate a juror if they have to. And he says, you think your average juror is King Solomon? No, he's a roofer with a mortgage. He wants to go home and sit in his barca lounger and let the cable TV wash over him. And this man doesn't give a single solitary droplet of shit about truth, justice, or your American way. Those are really different views, right? Um, a check on tyranny or, like, nobody cares. Now, back to the people who were jurors. Did any of you view it that way? Were any of you like, you know, it's just someone's life or their money or a company. Let's just mail it in. Anybody mail it in? I would tell you that the literature, the research, everyday experience, people who observe juries, is that, it, you know, when you think about a post-truth era, I would tell you jurors are, by definition, supposed to be fact finders, right? They are trying to decide who's telling the truth. When two witnesses say something different about what happened, when there's a different narrative about whether the company knew that the product was defective or not, the jurors are supposed to sort out what's true. And what the, the, so I'm going to give you, it sort of, we'll do it three ways. I'm going to give you the good news. 
I'll then temper the good news so you don't leave here just skipping away. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about what I think we ought to do to make sure we protect juries. So the good news. Um, before I ever started doing this, there were people that had been doing studies for 20 years on juries. And what's interesting is if you read uh, by Valerie Hahn or Sherry Diamond or Edie Green or others who study juries, um, they almost all say the same thing, which is overall I think juries do a pretty good job. Um, for example, there was a massive study where they asked judges who were sitting and watching cases to then afterwards say what they would have done in the case. Who would have won, and if it was a civil case, what would you have awarded if the plaintiff won? And then they compared that to jury verdicts, and what they found is they were very similar. Juries weren't doing radically crazy things that smart judges who see cases all the time wouldn't. Um, there have been studies where they measured the severity of injury and asked jurors rate how severe these injuries are, and then they did that across the country, and they found those numbers were pretty consistent. The Arizona Jury Project, Sherry Diamond was given rare access to 50 juries where she could watch real deliberations. They could be taken down um, by a stenographer. And so you had 50 deliberations. You know what they found? When a, a couple of examples. When a juror said, you know, I think so-and-so said that the light was red. And that's dead wrong, right? It, that's not what the witness said. You know what happened? The other jurors in the room, over 90% of the time, fact corrected. They said, no, no, I, I don't think it was red. I think, I think she said it was green. And then someone else said, my notes say green. And someone else said, my notes say green. And before you knew it, because there was more than one person in the room, the fact got corrected. This idea that jurors are you know, deciding cases on facts that, that are completely wrong, there's not a lot of evidence from people that have studied real juries that they do it. What they're doing is they are, through a deliberative process, arriving at an agreed set of facts that typically some of the people that have taken notes and are more diligent, the gunners of the jury, um, <laughs> are, are correcting and giving information that's helpful. Okay? Um, they found that jurors, over 50% of the time in the jury room, the first thing that happened was they said, why don't we go around and let everybody say what they're thinking about the case and talk about it. And then the four person typically would say, um, you haven't talked, will you share with us? that people actually did a pretty good job of listening to voices. Perfect job, no, of course not. Uh, but what they found was that jurors were doing a pretty good job. So I wanted to check this against something that I see a lot uh, in, jury, in trial work, which is this idea that if you're a smooth enough lawyer and you talk to the jury in a way that makes them think you're part of the club, uh, that they'll just come along and vote with you. And I sort of wanted to contrast that cynical view of juries, which I would call the runaway jury idea. You know, they don't care. Just, if they like you, you're good. They'll vote for you, and it'll get them home sooner. Um, to this idea that juries are rigorous. So I'll give you, you can be part of the experiment, at least to predict what you think the outcome would be and, and how much. So let me just give you an example of what we did. I took a case, and I based it on a case I had handled, a real case, uh, a gender discrimination case. And the basic facts were that a woman who ran a grocery store, in the, in the real case of Walmart, um, got a health inspection. And the health inspection found all this kind of piddly stuff, like the, the hose was too close to the water so you could get cross-contamination. And one shelf um, had rust on the back of it. Uh, but nothing like, you have salmonella, like two things. But she felt like the, the manager above her was gunning for her job. She felt like he wanted to fire her. And so she was very nervous. And so she called a friend who was a state representative and said, I have fixed the two problems that they found. Can you call the health, com the health inspector and ask them to come back out as soon as possible so that I can show I've fixed it? She did not bribe anybody. She didn't do anything improper. She was fired. Okay? We brought a claim for gender discrimination because there was some pretty good evidence that a number of women were fired in the company, kind of all in the same area, about the same time by the same guy, and always replaced by his like brother-in-law or friend or whatever. Okay. That's the background, that's the case, that's the facts. They're not gonna change. But here was the experiment. I wondered, well, what if we frame that case one of two ways before the jurors hear those facts? What if I gave an opening statement that is conservatively framed, or a closing argument, depending on where you put it, that's conservatively framed or sort of super progressively liberally framed. 
here's what I mean. So I'll just give you a little bit of the, the, cl the uh, closing argument from a conservative frame. You've heard the facts. As a juror, our founding fathers envisioned uh, that you would be the one who decides what happens. You and only you have that power. No matter how dysfunctional everything else is in the country, the jury system continues. It gives you the power to enforce the rule of law. Ellen, that was the name of this woman in my hypothetical, is a tough, hardworking, loyal woman. She worked for the same company for 15 years. That used to be what people did, but it's not so common now. Ellen doesn't whine. Ellen didn't complain. Ellen continued to find, be gritty and find solutions to problems. The company, on the other hand, is being politically correct. She can't call a, a, her own state representative and take a little initiative to get a solution. The company was not loyal. It didn't follow the rule of law and it didn't act fair. It didn't show the loyalty that a company of 50 years ago would have shown. What it did was illegal. And so Ellen should win, right? Something like that. Here's the liberal frame. Let's talk about this case. Juries exist in part so that minority groups and those in protected classes can't be abused. It's the role of the jury to stand up for the least among us. And in cases like this, it's the role of the jury that say that equality matters and that companies can't bully their employees just because of their gender. Ellen's a victim of a large corporation that thinks it's above the law. Ellen was honest, caring, kind. She sacrificed time away from her children. She worked through stress and hard times. She endured a pattern of discrimination that any woman would recognize. Da da da, Ellen should win. All right? The facts don't change, but how we talk about the case changed pretty dramatically. Now, here's the question this is the million dollar question. Since we put the spin of sort of something that sounded a lot like conservative ideas or something that sounded a lot like progressive frames, would we see a change in the win rate among those groups? So we asked jurors when they came into our sort of portal, you know, a lot of questions to identify them. And then we wanted to know, do liberal jurors vote more often for liability for Ellen when they hear the liberal frame? Or do they get really upset when they hear this sort of conservative frame that doesn't ring in their ear quite right and then vote less? Same thing for conservatives. All right, now you get to vote because I know you didn't go read the paper. So um, I, I now we'll get, the, we'll get to the punchline. How many of you think that the frames changed how jurors voted so that if they heard one, let's start with this. How many of you think if they heard one that sounded like what they believe, words they say they value, ideas they say they value, that they were more likely to vote for liability? All right, and then the second, that's oh, well over, that's two-thirds, I think. How many of you think that then if you heard one that like, oh, it just graded like nails on a chalkboard, because that's not how you talk, that they voted less for liability? So some of you think maybe not then. Here's the interesting thing. And at first, this is going to sound like, why did we do all this then? It didn't make a bit of difference. None. We could not detect an effect in any direction for any group, including subgroups. When we built most common characteristics of people, when we looked at individual questions, when we looked at self-rating of conservative or liberal, when we asked people, do you value personal accountability or not? Do you use this kind of language? It didn't make a difference in liability rates. People didn't vote for it more when it was framed the way they liked to talk and the way they believed. They didn't vote for it less when they heard something that annoyed them. Why does that matter? I think it tells us that jurors can see through BS. You know what they decided the case on? The facts. They decided the case on the facts. And you know what predicted what they might do? The only thing that really predicted what they might do? Some of their predispositions as people certainly could tell us something. For example, certain groups were 5% less likely to find liability than other groups. So it's not to say that the things we bring with us to the jury room don't affect how we decide. But it is to say that I think there's a growing body of evidence that jurors actually can get at truth um, better than we might give them credit for and that they're less limiting and more lying. All right? Um, 
you might not be surprised that as a trial attorney, then I would say um, we should be less afraid to trust juries. We don't need to give them caps. We can let them do what they think is right. We don't need to shelter them from all the evidence. We can let them decide it. We don't need to believe that, oh, well, they'll, they'll always um, just mail it in on a Friday afternoon because they want to get home. Juries have debated for days and weeks because they care about the, the result. And in fact, the more we involve people in juries, what we find is they tend to have more faith in the judicial system afterward because they say, I know we didn't just go mail this in. We took it seriously. Maybe this thing works. All right, so I told you I'd make you happy and then give you a quick conclusion. I'm about there. Um, a, a, a quick word of caution. This is not to say that jurors don't have biases. It's not to say that they're not susceptible to cognitive bias like all of us. So what we did find mattered was that some people had pre-held beliefs. For example, they believed that there are too many lawsuits, that lawsuits are sort of like a lottery, and that people use them just to get rich. If you believed that fundamentally and deeply, you were less likely to find liability in all the cases we tested, no matter, how, no matter what the facts were. Conversely, you could imagine someone who believes all corporations are evil, every single one of them cheats everybody, and I don't think that the corporation here would have gotten a fair day. So what does that tell us? I think what it means is, is that the, the vision of a jury of your peers uh, that is a fair jury means that we need a little bit of voir dire. Uh, we need a little bit of selection. And in the courts where they've gone to this idea that, well, the first 12 in the box come up, first six in the box come on up, it's a very dangerous idea because you have sometimes people who have predisposed beliefs or life experiences related to that case that will mean that their biases don't allow them to hear the evidence. And frankly, what we know is you can't even spin them into listening to the evidence. All right? They're going to decide it based on what they already know and what they already feel. So if we do a little bit of basic work to make sure that the people sitting there can hear this case, and then we give them time to actually work through it, the jury system is still a system that functions to both ensure that people believe in the judicial system a little bit, that they get to experience it, and that produces results that, believe it or not, over years of study, su suggest they are reasonably reliable and reasonably good. Um, so I would say uh, let's, let's keep trusting juries. Let's keep having jury trials. My own personal plug for anybody who's a trial lawyer going to be one. The jury trial is going like this. The number of jury trials each year is plummeting. It's going away. And if you believe in the Constitution, the Sixth and Seventh Amendment suggests that it shouldn't. And so as lawyers, we have a duty to make sure we keep having jury trials, that we don't let people waive those rights every day in every contract so there's never another jury trial. We have, a right, we have an obligation to try cases to juries. And I think if you're a judge, many of you will be or might be now or will be one day, um, please remember this talk enough to remember that there's good evidence we can trust these juries that we ought to let lawyers pick through them a little bit, get a fair middle group, strike the outliers, and then trust them to return fair verdicts. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Campbell. Mr. McRoberts, the floor is yours for cleanup. Thank you very much. So, in the introduction, he mentioned this conference I attended uh, a few years ago called The Conspiracy Proves, and I want to start off with a very quick anecdote from that experience, because it was honestly just terrifying. Uh, there were a couple of speakers on the ship, and it was a cruise ship, so I put Conspiracy Conference. A couple of speakers on the ship who were there to talk mostly about legal and financial issues. The rest were, you know, crop circles, alien invasion, stuff like that. I was interested in the legal guys, because that's my background. And one of them was a man named Winston Shrout, who was just recently, as in a few weeks ago, convicted and sentenced to 10 years in prison for, among other things, hand printing about a trillion and a half dollars of phony financial instruments, mailing them to a bank and asking if they be cash. So not a sharp operator in a lot of ways. But he has made over half a million dollars scamming people by selling legal services and legal advice and financial advice. And on the ship, I heard him give a bunch of lectures to people who really didn't know any better about how they could win any legal case by basically performing esoteric rituals with their birth certificate. Print it off, get it notarized, use red ink, put your thumbprint on it, do this, do that, and the judge will have to rule in your favor because that's how the legal system works. And sitting in the lectures, I think, you know, the people in the audience are an average slice of America. They're relatively sophisticated, relatively well-educated, 
One guy's an optometrist, one guy's a financial advisor. These people aren't idiots, they're not stupid, but they don't have any connection to the legal system. No legal education, no legal experience. And there's a man that everyone has told them they should trust explaining this stuff to them. They're gonna believe that even if he's not completely right, he's probably mostly right, and so it's worth spending a little bit of money to get some private advising, private consulting, and that's kind of how the scam works. Really depressing stuff. And then the last session on the conference was kind of a wrap-up speech, <laughs> clean up like I am, and I thought, this is the chance to really see how you could talk somebody out of believing in this nonsense. And at first, I thought it was gonna be really easy, because he gets up to kind of summarize all of the lectures he's been giving over the course of the week, and he says, in this very kind of fake, folksy way, you know, I realize my advice is really hard to follow for some people, and I wanna tell you why it is it's so hard for you to understand me. It's because y'all are operating in the third dimension, and I tend to vibrate in the higher fifth and sometimes the lower sixth dimensions. And he went on to explain, and this is not an exaggeration, <laughs> that he was a representative of the intergalactic round table, where he represented the interests of Earth as the, to the guardians of Earth's financial interests. And as the Earth representative to the intergalactic round table, sometimes his clients ask him, do you ever work with fairies and elves? And he said, well, of course. And in fact, not too long ago, I worked with the Queen of the Fairies, and I persuaded her to use her power to move the international date line from London to Paris, which obviously had the effect of removing international financial transactions from the jurisdiction of the Queen of England, which is why the Federal Reserve couldn't be rechartered. And he connected this to the promise that soon the Vatican would start paying off everybody's mortgages. And I'm sitting at the front row of this conference, and I think, well, Thank Christ, because now I'm done. I don't have to worry about anybody trusting this guy because he just explained that he works with the queen of the fairies to recharter everybody's mortgages. And then I turn around in my seat and I realize everybody's nodding their head. They're bought <laughs> in. They believe this. And I start to think about why that is. These people aren't stupid. They're not ignorant. But what they're not is they're not individuals. There is no such thing as an individual brain, an individual person, an individual juror. We are our communities. We think with our communities. We use the people around us, especially the people we trust, the people we admire, the people we want to be like. We use them as part of our thought process. They validate information for us. They provide credibility checks for us. And so if you're sitting in an audience and you don't know for a fact that what you're hearing is wrong, and you're hearing someone who's been vetted by the conference, who's been approved by the people around you, and has the weight of that credibility, it becomes very difficult to think and hear and really reason through the information that's being presented, which is how reasonable people who are as smart as you are, who are as sane as you are, can be persuaded to give money to somebody who claims to be a partner of the Queen of the Elves, because that's how human beings work. And that is how human beings have always worked. Shrout is a senior citizen. He has been doing this for decades, and he didn't invent it. He is the inheritor of a very long tradition of nutso American con artists. It works because that's how human beings are. And I want to push back against the idea of this conference. I don't think we do live in a post-fact era. I don't think we ever lived in a fact era. We have always lived in a world where human beings are sloppy, lazy thinkers, because that is how human beings are. We can also be rational, we can also be good thinkers, we can also be brilliant, but there's always that underlying fact that this is just how human beings think. So, that brings us down into what about juries, and what about judges, and what about trial lawyers? We are also all human and we are all subject to the same irrationality, the same problems, and how we reason through these issues. I want to focus in particular on the idea of these cognitive biases that are being discussed. It's true, and it's a huge problem, and it's a very profit, a prof, profligate area of research in terms of what are the cognitive biases that affect not just jurors, but everybody else. But as a practitioner, I don't want to get too stuck in the idea of here's the individual ways in which human beings fail to think. My practice is negotiation, and I really focus on how do you persuade someone to agree when money is immediately on the line, when it immediately pays off. 
And what we see is that in those cases, while you can definitely focus on things like the sunk cost fallacy, you can focus on things like the status quo fallacy, they're very influential in how people make decisions, it's also usually a lot broader than that. Usually we break it down to a simple cost-benefit analysis. People tend to make decisions that bring them the most benefit as they see it from their perspective. And what tends to drive that cost-benefit analysis more than anything else in my experience is a sense of community. We value the community we belong to largely because that community is literally who we are. Remember, going back to that original idea of there not being such a thing as an individual person. If there's no such thing as an individual person, then the community you belong to is in a very literal sense the person that you are. And when you ask someone to make a decision that pulls them away from the community they value, the community they want to be a part of, you're asking them, in a sense, to deny themselves. And most people won't do that. Or at the very least, they'll make you spend too much in a negotiation to do that. Or they'll make you spend too much time trying to prove the necessary facts to do that. This means that we're never really in a world where there's such a thing as a pure data conflict. Even if we're talking about, is the sun shining in the sky today? The fact is, if I ask you that, and the people you trust, the people you rely on, the people you admire tell you that it's not, many of you would agree with them instead of me because we tend to think through the people around us. And there are great empirical studies on this in which you plant someone in a crowd and you have the people, the plants, claim something that is obviously factually false and watch test subjects agree with what they know to be false instead of what they know to be true. Something as simple as, is this a straight line or is this a curved line? If the plants keep saying this curved line is straight, then the test subject will agree this curved line is straight because they think through those people. We can see how this turns into the kinds of problems that have already been discussed, right? We can see how this affects juries. If a jury doesn't want to make a decision that pulls against its sense of community, then you're going to have a very hard time relying on facts to do it. The good news is the community that is actually in question it depends on your perspective as the subject and as the observer. And what I mean by that is we can look at the jury and say, well, what is their community? Are those rogue jurors, is their community a political community in that they are Trump voters? Is it an economic community in that this is how I make my money and how much money I have? Or is it the immediate contextual community of, I am in a jury. And as part of this jury, my job and what defines this community is the work of making the factual analysis that sits there in front of us. And in many cases, that immediate contextual community is going to be the strongest and most influential community, which is why juries can be, in a lot of cases, so reliable. But we have to be very careful about how we see what those communities are. And what I'd like to see in terms of long-term progress and long-term development in this area is tools and tactics for improving that, for reinforcing the sense of that immediate community, because that's what's going to be the most effective in terms of pushing people to make rational decisions. Because the rationality we're looking for, that ability to make fact-based decisions, doesn't come from just telling somebody, hey, you should be more factual, you should be more rational. People can't do that in many cases. It comes from rewarding them for being factual. It comes from biasing that cost-benefit analysis. And the way we do that is by reminding them, you are part of a community, and that community is defined around its ability to make these rational decisions. There is no single tactic that will do this. We will never get to a point where you can talk to an individual person or a group of people and trust them absolutely to make simple, clear, logical, rational decisions. We have to get human beings out of the process for that to happen, and I don't think that's a good idea either. The good news is we don't really have to worry about it too much because we have been in that world forever, and it's working pretty well for us so far. But we can start to think about some things to improve that world over time. One is going back to this idea of what we Texans call voir dire. I don't know so much about the voir dire stuff. <laughs> in voir dire, I want to see more questions asked that are designed not just to draw information from the jury, but to communicate with the jury, to negotiate with the jury, and to encourage them to redefine that sense of community. What if questions and broad questions? What do you think a jury should do in this case? What is a jury's job generally? How do you see that? Not just because I want to hear individual jurors talk about it and hear their own voice say a jury's job is to be driven by the facts and to make the right decisions, 
but I want to hear them hear it from other jurors. I want them to feel the sense of being part of a community and part of a jury that works on this. I'd like to see closing statements emphasize that more aggressively, that this is the job of the jury. And that can be framed in a liberal or conservative manner, but it needs to be framed in the sense of this is the jury's job, because what we're trying to do is create a scaffold. People cannot be changed externally. It's almost impossible to use the right arguments and really drive a significant change in someone's closely held opinions and beliefs. They change their own minds. The most effective way to persuade someone is to provide a scaffolding for them to do that. Empirically, I've done some work with doctors groups in the West Coast in terms of increasing vaccination rates. And we've seen in practice the kind of backfire effect the keynote speaker talked about, in which if a doctor gives a parent who's worried about vaccines a stack of papers and says, here's all the scientific research, here's why you should vaccinate your kids, it's the best way to protect them from dangerous diseases, it decreases the odds that the parent will vaccinate their kids. Essentially, because what you're telling them is, there is a dispute, there's an argument, you have to take sides. And when you tell someone to take sides in a dispute, they tend not to do it based on what the scientific research says or even what the evidence says. They tend to do it based on which side is more sympathetic, which side makes me feel more like the person I want to be. And for a parent, that may be, well, I want to be all natural. I don't want to rely on drugs and medicine and chemicals. I want to do something else instead. And so when you identify the dispute, you drive people to different sides of the dispute, which can decrease that adherence we're looking for. What tends to work is asking questions. Why do you feel that way? What are you worried about? Why are you worried about it? Who do you trust to give you information on this? Those are the types of questions that you can't really ask a jury in the course of the trial, but Ward Iyer gives us a chance to do it. It gives us a chance to start to drive that questioning process again, not to pull the information out of the panel, but instead to communicate to the panel and to provide the scaffold that they can use to build that sense of community for and among themselves. Lastly, I think it's critical here to start thinking about how we practice and what we do. Because, and this is what I do in my practice as a negotiation consultant, when I go in to talk to somebody about how, well, you negotiate with these irrational people, and of course you're such a victim because they won't say yes, even though they should, because the numbers are on your side, really what I almost always wind up doing is telling people, you know what, it's not about them. It's about you. You are also irrational. You are also failing to see this from an objective perspective because there is no such thing as an objective perspective, at least not one that you can persuade them exists in the same way. So it's almost always about that sense of awareness of what is driving your analysis here? What is your bias? Where does it come from? And how are they going to see it in context? When we've got that sense of awareness, that sense of here is why the problem exists on both sides of the table, it makes it easier to adopt what I think is going to work in the long term which is a very consistent and very constant set of best practices. Asking those questions, driving that sense of healthy community, asking the people in the jury as part of the jury to be part of the community, and not in any one particular tactical way, but through that long-term sense of we're gonna develop over time this community-centric model of juries, but also decision-making generally in the legal world. And in the long term, structurally, we can look at things like larger juries, because the rule of large, the law of large numbers is one of the strongest bulwarks we have against irrational thinking. Two large groups can obviously have their own types of irrationality, but when you have a larger group of people, you tend to have more people who are willing to step up and correct facts, and those factual corrections are always going to be more influential and more persuasive coming from inside the jury than coming from outside of the jury, because that's the kind of influential community practice you want to see. Going back to the idea that Skino Kika talked about of surprising validators, that's where they're gonna come from in the jury context is inside that jury. You want someone who is part of the community saying, we aren't doing it right, we've made a mistake, we have to go back and fix it, because an outside voice, even if they were allowed inside the jury room, would never be as persuasive. And no witness is ever going to be as persuasive as the juror talking about what the witness said to their fellow jurors. So identifying and developing champions is one way that advocates can use that to drive decision-making practice inside the jury itself. I forgot to start my timer on the end, so I'm going to kind of wrap it up, make sure you have time for questions. But I want to really bring back to that simple idea. If you take anything away from this particular session, I would like you to take away the idea that there is no such thing as an individual juror, no such thing as an individual lawyer, no such thing as an individual judge. When you are an advocate, when you are trying to persuade a human being, you are trying to persuade a community because they will assess everything you have to say through the community they trust 
whether it's someone in the room with them in the sense of a jury, or whether it's the sense of, would my community trust this person? Would my community accept this argument? Would other jurors, or other judges, other lawyers in the same community receive this argument effectively? Talk to the community and be aware of the community that you're a part of because it's affecting how you receive that information as well. All right, thank you. Now we've come to the audience participation uh, part of this. So what I'm gonna do is steal one of the microphones and go roam about the audience. So if you have questions, I'll run right to you. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a good question. Can you hear me? Um, let's see, where's the on button? Okay, uh, it's a good question. So by, by saying we can trust juries, I certainly don't mean that they don't, that they're perfect. Um, one way to think of this though is, is what is the other option? Um, and so starting there, the other option would be to allow a judge to do it. And I think we would see, we would actually concentrate racial disparity more the moment we go from a bigger group to a smaller group. Um, one solution to improve this, of course, is I completely agree, is bigger juries. Uh, a troubling phenomenon is that in federal courts we often have a jury of six. In many states, juries of six, sometimes nine. Um, never bigger than 12, really, anywhere, um, or, or 11. Um, the other thing that the research shows is that if we were doing effective voir dire and we really took seriously that you need a jury of your peers, I think we would also mitigate racial bias to some degree because, for instance, the Arizona Jury Project suggested that even if you have one minority juror, and that minority meaning minority in whatever way that juror, jury was sort of lacking, but also certainly like, for example, racial minorities, um, the fact that one racial minority was on the jury meant that there were less overt statements that showed racial bias because it brought some awareness to that jury. So I think juries fail more because we don't put them together right than they fail because the idea of a jury doesn't work. So for example, you have a federal court, um, it's very common, where the judge will say, well, we're, I'm gonna do the voir dire, uh, or the voir dire. Um, are, you from, are you from Texas? Yeah, I'm from Dallas, so I can still talk like that if I need to. Um, the, yeah, the voir dire. Uh, the, 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 the judge will say, well, I'm gonna, I'll do it. It's going to take 10 minutes. Attorneys, you can ask two questions, but they better not be very specific. And they, That's crazy talk. Um, we should be recognizing that we actually need a jury of peers and that we need to eliminate. If we had more time, we could talk about the solid evidence that, for example, when someone says, I've had this view, and it sounds a little biased, and then the judge looks at him and says, uh, can you set that aside and be fair? And they go, oh, yeah. Come on, they set, they set aside 30 years of bias. I mean, it defies all cognitive science. They took their entire life's bias, they threw it away because the judge said so. The, you know the studies show? That the person who says they can set aside their bias is more biased than the person who says they can't because the person who says they can't at least understands bias enough to say, it might actually affect me, and then they're looking for it. The person who's like, well, I can set aside bias, they don't even understand it exists, much less how to correct. So look, there's definitely those things. I think the answer is actually not less jury, it's more jury, more jurors, and more time to pick through that jury to make sure we have a representative sample. All right, Hi, I'm David Rubenstein. I'm a professor here at Washburn. I have, first of all, this is a wonderful panel. It's a wonderful symposium. I have a sort of general point, and I think it's a question. But as a general point, I'm, first of all, I'm very steeped in a lot of the psychology and sociology and political science you've heard about. So all these ideas of heuristics and biases, I, I get it. Thing. And it's making me think that you know next year we need a uh, a kind of like a, a meta post truth because I'm sitting here wondering you know you're telling me about biases what I'm supposed to believe and, 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 and I'm, I'm 
feeling myself using these very biases to, to filter out and say, do I believe what you're telling me about what's true? And I think, it's, I think we should all be thinking about how it, these are actively happening subconsciously as we're listening to a discussion about the very things that issue. That's just a general point. And so, John, I, I want to I, I use yours, I think, as, as an example. Uh, I start with the halo effect, which is, you know, I, I mean it in, in a nice way, obviously. The halo effect is, you know, someone presents very confidently, um, and speaks, uh, with, you know, assertively and clearly, subconsciously, we tend to credit that information. So, on the one hand, I believe everything you said, because you presented it, by the way, very well. <laughs> um, Thank you. I was trying to manipulate your halo effect, so I'm glad that worked. And that is what, and that is what politicians do. <laughs> Lawyers do, to, to, you know, and so on. So that's one of these uh, biases that is going on uh, all the time. On the other hand, it, it was interesting that you, you had us raise our hand to, to you know, take a poll. And I was one of the, the wrong people in the wrong group, two thirds. And what was interesting about that is you did it to make a point, but as soon as I was in the wrong group, I felt my confirmation bias kick in. And I was looking for ways why you were wrong. Because like everything you said went against what I thought would have been the right answer based on cultural cognition theory and based on everything else. And so I'm thinking about like, well, you know, you've got the halo effect, so that's why I should believe him. But on the other hand, my confirmation bias is telling me it's making me feel uncomfortable. And so when you hear about the jury crossing their arm, it's a sign of physically uncomfortable, but mentally uncomfortable, and then confirmation bias makes us filter out back so, so this is what me, my, my processing through the confirmation bias, it's like, well, did he do that? You know, argument about liberal or progressive rights, say individualistic or egalitarian, or however you want to frame it at the end, as a closing argument or at the as an opening argument. So uh, interestingly, I do, I do want to go too far in the weeds. We tried it both places. So we did an opening statement that used the, almost the exact same frames, and then a closing argument. And we also presented one as a base case where they didn't hear any of that; they just read the facts. Um, what we found was no ordering effect. So even when we primed them, which was my suspicion, prime them and then let them see the fact, but maybe it won't work after they've seen them. We saw no difference um, before or after. We could not get an effect. I mean, this stunned me because it was a null and I fully expected to generate an effect. Um, we couldn't find one anywhere um, in, in any order. And, so, and, and, I, and I think that's just fascinating. I think it's a tremendously useful study. And I, I like the idea that I can correct my predisposed belief, but man, I'm convinced. Uh, I'd also offer an alternative explanation. I mean, the very fact that you are able to frame the case under all those different world views suggests that you don't know what happened in the jury room. So people can be taking those facts, and in order to come up with the right results or the results that you would anticipate, they're able to look at those facts in a way that is consistent with their world view. Because as you demonstrated through the alternative framings, a juror can take the same facts and make it fit comfortably with how they see the world. I think you're absolutely right. So what we saw, for example, is one example. Uh, people who are self-identified as extremely conservative were about 10% less likely to find liability across three different cases. One was an injury case, one was the discrimination case, and one was a contract dispute. So certainly the, what we bring to the jury room does influence how we receive the information. I think what, what maybe is an explanation for this is that those long-held beliefs and biases and experiences are not so easily manipulated, right? So it's not to say we don't need to be aware that they exist and even call out the most extreme on either side. It is to say I think we don't need to worry so much that attorneys can sort of, with their you know, silver-tongued uh, you know, attorneys can somehow uh, manipulate jurors quickly. But I completely agree that the, the bias rides through, which is why I think we, we need bigger juries, we need more jury selection time, and we need to stop rehabilitating jurors when they openly admit to bias. If I can add on to that, one thing we've seen in practice is that people are extremely resilient to persuasion when they know you're trying to persuade them. And so I think that has to color everything we talk about in jury practice, in the study or in the real world. You see, for example, a lot of defense attorneys who are putting on, criminal defense attorneys who have a ponytail, a male attorney who's on a ponytail, a fancy boots, or trying to put on kind of a flashy atmosphere. I don't know that it works. I don't know that the closing arguments and the opening arguments, you can bias people with the clever arguments of the words, because you're talking explicitly and specifically to someone who knows you are trying to persuade me. They are at their most <laughs> defensive. 
it, where it might be effective, though, is when they're least defensive, is, again, inside that jury room, inside those deliberations, any kind of argument that lands and that sticks and that gets discussed inside the jury is slipping behind those defenses and maybe much more influential. And in terms of practice, that's where we get down to telling people, make sure your argument is as simple and as clear as possible so it can be broken down into simple sound bites and the simple conversational pieces, which maximizes the odds those pieces get broken down and made part of the discussion inside deliberations, where they'll be much more persuasive than if you're deliberate with someone in the front court right way. You're reminding me of, there's a, there's a great attorney named Rick Friedman who um, literally wrote the book on plaintiff's trial law that called the rules of the road. But one of the things that Rick mentioned one time when we were talking was um, that he never tries to persuade a jury too early because it, they'll push back. And, and he really wants them to sort of feel like they found the answer. And so in that sense, it's interesting because if those of you are going to be trial lawyers, one of the takeaways here is it's not that framing doesn't matter. It's that the superficial framing doesn't. But the evidence you're showing and what evidence you're selecting and the ordering of that evidence may matter a great deal, right? And so thinking more about that and spending more time in discovery shaping your case and more time with your experts and the way they're going to message the case, that is going to matter a lot more than the sort of gloss you put on a case in the front and back. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's a persuasion that's happening and it's a question about where and how yeah. um, that's really interesting and fun to try to sort out if you're a trial lawyer. All right. Hi, Ann Mullins from Stetson University College of Law. And I'm also a former Texas trial lawyer, so I wore dire in more capital goods too. <laughs> so, um, look, I believe the jurors get it right most of the time. But, and, 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 I'm, and I might be on board that bigger juries might be better, more more dire might be better. Um, but ultimately, it doesn't root out the implicit bias that everybody has, right? So, you know, and, and just because somebody is a member of a particular group, like Dr. Strong illustrated uh, very uh, graciously with herself, that doesn't mean that you don't hold those implicit biases. So I'm still troubled by studies of, of juries that show things, for example, like more attractive plaintiffs uh, collect more, more attractive defendants pay less. I'm wondering um, if you've looked at any of the jurisdictions that provide implicit bias training to the jury pool, whether you think that that is effective, particularly given that it's given in a mandatory circumstance, um, and, and if there's any empirical data that can attest to that. Um, I, I'll take a stab at that. I mean, so New Jersey, for example, um, uh, Tacoma, not Tacoma, uh, the county that Seattle's in, that I'm forgetting, uh, but uh, the county that Seattle's in, there's a few places that have tried some form of this. Um, there also sometimes they do this with instructions, jury instructions. They'll, they'll go further in explaining why the instruction exists or why you shouldn't use the evidence for a certain purpose. Um, I think the literature, both in juries and beyond, is that bias, we can certainly get people to identify bias and then mitigate bias a bit. But there's this other problem. So let's say we all figured out our bias. By the way, just a side note, since a lot of people in law school are pretty smart and lawyers are pretty smart, uh, there's some pretty good evidence that the smarter you get, the better you get at confirmation bias, because you get really good. So the Cultural Cognition Project has found that the smarter a person is, the longer their list of justifications for their gut beliefs are, but they actually don't get any better at self-critical thinking. Um, so don't think because you're smart you're going to duck this. It's not true. You might get worse. Um, the, uh, that's just a note. But the, the other thing is, though, is it's interesting, Anne, that if you get someone to address bias and they recognize, oh, gosh, I'm susceptible to even a simple thing like anchoring, right, which is, you know, um, they've done studies, and I even did a study where we sort of identified that, and the defense said, the plaintiff's trying to anchor you, and anchoring's bad, and, and they're just trying to trick you with this big number that'll anchor you, and you won't be able to resist it, and resist it. Um, the problem is, let's assume we all identify all of our biases. Unless we know the exact percentage of strength of our bias, we don't know how to correct it. So then we get these weird overcorrection effects or undercorrection effects. So you can imagine somebody goes, oh, uh, so there was this interesting study by, I think it was Jessica Salerno at Arizona State, in which they were told, people were told, these bloody photographs can really enrage jurors and then they'll convict people too often of a crime. So when you see these bloody photos, identify that bias and resist. And you know what they did? They started not convicting at a rate that was not consistent with the evidence, right? So, so the hardest part of bias is, is that even if we flag it and name it, we are not good at correcting for it. And so I think one correction is 
you have to get enough people that you're washing out the biases with big numbers. Um, you know, in some future talk, my radical presentation would be replacing juries with online juries of 100 people and having a simple two-thirds rule um, and, and stop selection entirely and take 100 or 150 people and show them the case uh, once recorded uh, to get rid of some of this. But I mean, that's, you know, that, that's another day. But I, it's a really challenging problem to get through bias. That's my nightmare. I, I can't imagine. <laughs> because I think if you get too large a group, and especially an online group, then you'd remove a lot of the pressure to be a responsible jury. And I think you would wind up with essentially a jury of 100 trolls, which could be disastrous. <laughs> but you'd have to do a lot of work to yeah. educate that group yeah. and work with them. What might be nice is professional jurors, people who actually have significant training and identify this as part of my identity is, I'm aware of the bias, I have a lot of experience in the bias, I've had a lot of training, I've got a sense for the overcorrection effect and the undercorrection effect because I am a juror, and I've done 50 of these cases instead of one every 30 years. So, you know, there are states that have a model of that. For example, uh, Kentucky, I think, is where they'll impanel a jury, and then they will sit as a jury. Um, some form of them will sit as a jury for months. And so they start hearing cases over and over again. Um, that'd be interesting to figure Do out they get better? what that's worth. I don't know. I haven't ever seen <laughs> any data on that. Um, but I just learned that because a trial attorney we worked with was picking a jury and said, oh, yeah, they've already heard three cases. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, we've got time for a few more questions. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Um, I had a question actually for Professor Cunningham about the work that you did. I, I'm intrigued very much so by the, the work that you did after after the article. Um, and I was wondering if the Harpoothian and Kenny um, study, that some of the work that you've done in terms of unpacking what might have happened um, first, I assume there were probably no post interviews with the jurors themselves, so the, the, the folks that were singled out and characterized. So I'm sure we don't have anything on that. But can you think of anything that, any type of takeaway um, in terms of getting to that very critical, rich information that's being missed? Is there something we can do in the process, um, perhaps of educating jurors or, or informing them, like, look, if you have some type of community standard that you think is appropriate to bring into this, this is the way, or this is not the way. So what, what do you think we can do in terms of maybe um, folding your work into the system? Right. That's what, I think that's a very interesting question. It was one thing that struck me about the article itself is when I first re read it, I didn't recognize that it was a trigger piece. I. Uh, I focused on two plaintiff's attorneys, I was a plaintiff's attorney, I've tried cases, I've had rogue jurors before, and I sympathized, but then when I looked at it through this other prism, I said, wow, there are all these things that they're doing to trigger us, and I started to suspect the piece, because I said, why don't they tell us that they tried it? It was the first thing that came up through, came up through the Google search, that um, very, very quick return, unanimous jury um, verdict, and they gave them more than they asked for. So I said, wow, wouldn't that have been the real debate to compare what the mock jurors did compared to what the actual jurors did, and what a rich conversation that would be. I think the way to ward against this is my premise, this idea that if we're aware of this otherization effect, we can start to call it out when we see it and avoid it. Uh, but there's just such a rich conversation that we didn't have, and that's because you have to wonder what, what motivated Harputhian and Kinney to write it. Uh, they, it does appear to be a political piece in the footnote. It's describing some of their political orientation. Uh, and I just think that there really is this effect. Once you trigger, and we're hearing that in all these different biases, but once you trigger, uh, it's really impossible to have that conversation. David Rock talks about, uh, we immediately start to say we have an in-group and an out-group. And David Rock suggests that we can't even hear what that out-group says. And so my, uh, one idea that I had with respect to the juries in particular um, is to do we instruct the juries on the ways that you should be thinking through a legal problem. If judges and, and trained legal minds have issues with that, imagine how jurors might struggle. Um, do we also make them aware of this otherization effect? So I think that there's a lot that we can do, and I think the starting point is to realize when we are being triggered and we're be when we're being taken off topic. I think that might be one of the most fundamental takeaways that I would urge people to think about is, am I being triggered? And then what impact does that have on my ability to focus my attention where I really should be focused? Okay. 
My question is that uh, as a current litigator, we had a jury trial earlier this year. Uh, it was an age discrimination case. We represented the employer. We lost. We weren't allowed to talk to the jury at the time, but as of two days ago, we did get permission from the court to try to communicate with the jury. If they agree, what questions should we be asking or what information would be helpful from your perspective? Um, well, I mean, so that's interesting because in one level, it's sort of a legal question, right? I mean, the, you, as you know, the, to even get to talk to the jury in that way is sometimes hard. And then the, the rules of evidence in almost every state and the federal rules of evidence are essentially that unless there was really improper influence, external improper influence, um, or something like that, that we won't disturb a jury verdict. So, for example, someone saying, I felt like I wasn't hurt. Um, you know, doesn't do it. Now, if the, if the purpose is to learn, one thing I'm always interested in is were there leaders and who were they and how much did they move? Because I think the biggest fear, so I, I helped pick a jury in Arizona about three months ago, four months ago maybe, and we lost the case. Um, and I think what happened is we had a jury of one. So we had one juror who was very loud, very hard-headed, it was a total mistake to leave them on, an idiot. Um, and, and there were three women in the jury who, when the verdict was returned four days later, they debated for four days, and they were given a hammer instruction to finish, and they were crying in, in the front row. And he was looking sort of like he'd won something. Um, and so I'd be curious about who the leaders were and how much they moved things. Um, I'm always fascinated by that dynamic, which is the hardest to simulate and the hardest to figure out. And I think the thing that will derail group decision making is if you get a really strong person who pushes so hard and says, I'll stay here all day, but I'm never changing my mind, how often that can move people uh, and break community and break discussion. Uh, I mean, that's the kind of stuff I always want to know. And then I'm always fascinated by what jurors thought was most important because it's rarely what you thought was most important. And it's a learning experience um, to, to hear the jurors say, you know what really drove us were these three facts that you think, because they might not have made much sense on the legal narrative. But in the factual, equitable narrative, they might have mattered a lot. So I always want to know what they what they locked in, in on. But so I think that's the right information you should be looking for. But I would urge you, whatever questions you ask, be extraordinarily skeptical of the answers. And no human being is good at understanding how they think. And as they're responding to whatever questions you ask, the respondent's goal is not to give you the most effective information. Their goal is to respond in such a way that validates the work they did as part of the jury. And so they may honestly tell you completely crappy information because they simply don't see what happened in that jury room or don't remember it accurately. That doesn't mean it's not useful information. It's fantastic people ask those questions because what they tell you is what they're focused on, even if it's not what actually motivated them at the time. But I absolutely would not take that information and then plug it straight into your next trial prep and assume that it's true or accurate, or that even if it is, it would apply to the next jury because it's just so much more confusing and chaotic than that. That's a really good point. I mean, I could not agree more that the idea is they're going to tell you what they're willing to talk about, which is useful, because that might be what's okay to sort of talk about in the room. Or, but it's interesting. You can imagine if you had a black juror and a white juror, I mean, a, a black plaintiff and a white plaintiff, and we know that could deliver differences in racial results. But if you ask the jury afterward, nobody would be like, well, I, I don't want to give a black person as much money, right? Um, so there's, there's these biases that will not be self-identified. Um, and that, frankly, I think you have to find, this is a shameless plug, but you almost have to find in advance through really big samples and then looking at plugging things in. You can actually, it's kind of cool, these days you can kind of do experimental stuff with testing your case. So you could, for example, present the case to hundreds of people and then put in or take out a fact or put in or take out an expert or change the gender of your plaintiff or whatever else and then see if it makes a difference. And if it does, you can find those things that they'll never self-report, but then you can identify as a true cause. All right, we've got time for about one more question. One, one quick suggestion. Okay. You might want to consider, instead of asking people, what did you do, asking what did other people on the jury think about? Because we're always better at thinking about how other people suck than what we did wrong. Well. So that <laughs> may give them a more accurate answer. I would agree, too, if you look at the death penalty research, what some jurors, after they've sentenced someone to death, you can tell they're trying to justify, like, oh, I thought I had to do that, like this rate of error amongst juries. I think they're trying to justify the result, and so I would be suspicious. But I think, again, going to the front end, if you have the jurors work through, the way they work through instructions, but if you had evidence on either side, whether the judge and the attorneys together create that list or the jurors are creating that list, 
but it gets you to the gut reaction coming at the, at avoiding the gut reaction by saying on the front end, what evidence did we hear on both sides of the prima facie case? So forcing the jurors to think about the evidence rather than asking them what they think up front. Yeah, you're making me think that another thought is, you know, we know that the first person who talks in a room moves, moves the group. I've often wondered if you should have jurors write down a self-reflection on how they view the case and the facts and what they're wondering about and all their concerns and say, nobody talks to anybody. And we don't start a conversation until everybody does this. Yeah. So that you don't have this idea shift immediately from the first person who expresses a strong idea. Uh, yeah. All right, one last little question we've got time. And Hi, uh, Joshua Brown. I'm a second year uh, law student here at Washburn. So I'm just curious uh, how important you guys feel it is for us as law students and future attorneys uh, to be studying these uh, sociological and psychological aspects of the application of the law. I think it's ex extremely important. I know when I was writing my own pieces, I was wondering, am I really writing a law review article? Because I was dealing with all of these other topics. But I think as, our, as, as Professor Strong noted this morning, there is this interconnectedness. And I think that will increasingly occur. And so I would encourage you to do that. I'll say this. For example, the book Thinking Fast and Slow by Danny Kahneman, um, I think it's legal malpractice not to have read it. I, I mean it. Because there are ways people decide things. I find myself referring to it even when writing for a judge. They, they, at a very manipulative level even, there are ways to frame things that will be more effective and that have been shown throughout the years to work. And there are ways that you're banging your head against the wall. And if you don't know some of that about how people think and decide, I think you're missing an, an opportunity as an advocate. Yeah, I'm a contrarian on this to a certain extent. I, I completely agree, and I tell my negotiation clients, Thinking Fast and Slow is the best book about negotiation, even though it has nothing to do with negotiation explicitly, because it's so critical to understanding how people make decisions. The research is wrong. We know the research is bad, in that if you try to replicate many of these critical studies that all of this is based on, you can't replicate the results, because the research wasn't right. But we also know the conclusions are right because it matches what we see in the real world. It matches how we can see more effective and less effective, effective arguments working. So I would say definitely study these aspects, study these issues. Don't get focused on the trees at the expense of the forest. So it's not about memorizing a list of cognitive biases because you're going to find out sooner or later, well, some of these actually don't work the way we thought they did. Focus more on just how people make decisions and look at it from that top-down practical perspective because as practitioners, that's going to be much more effective and influential than really digging into just the sociology research, which is slowly aligning to truth, but it's never really going to get there, and certainly isn't there yet. All right, well, we're out of time, so thank you very much to my students.